My free history. Little Jimmy has joined his author, but without proper equipment he is not of much use. Therefore we will now have a close look at all the stuff he receives in order to be a proper soldier. We have already heard that Janissaries used archabuses, and this brings up the question of their equipment. Since Janissaries were recruited similar to Jedi's, you could expect them to use lightsabers, but of course they did not. Agaston gives a more serious answer. Initially, the Janissaries were equipped with their formidable recurved bow, saber, shield and light coat of mail, while other units used crossbows, javelins and war axes. Under Morit II they began to use matchlock archibuses called Tyfek in Ottoman sources. Notable here is the Ottoman bow, which was, at least in their early times, the most important weapon of the Janissaries. Goodwin describes this bow. The Ottoman bow was related to the sacred bow of the Mongols. Every man of any status practiced archery and the training was strict and long. A boy began by learning how to flex a light practice bow for some years and then spent several more years just letting the bowstring fly. The bow itself was a work of art and time. Globstack wrote a whole book about the Turkish bow and its use in general. He describes the necessary components. The composite bow is made of a supporting skeleton or core of wood, to which on the belly or compression side strips of horn are glued, whereas the back, which experiences great tension, is provided with one or several layers of sinew fibers laid in glue. The function of the thin strip of wood in the limb is primarily that of supporting the materials that are so superbly suited to withstand the great forces of compression and tension which accompany the bending of the limb. Thus the wood and the glued joints had to be especially strong with respect to sharing stresses. We should take the time to go into much more detail regarding the production of the bow since it is a very impressive procedure. As we already have heard the glue was one of the most critical components. The process of making a bow was incredibly time consuming and required the best materials available. For the highest quality bows, glue that was made either from tendons or a combination of the ears or hide of cattle and skin from the roof of the mouth of a Danube sturgeon had to be cooked. The most interesting aspect here is the sturgeon. Tendons as well as ears and hides of cattle seem very common. On the other hand, the roof of the mouth of a Danube sturgeon seems like a very rare resource and probably resulted in the best glue. Globstack tells us more about what this kind of glue looked like. After several days of slow cooking, the pieces had become like leeches. The liquid was then strained off, evaporated to a viscous solution and poured into shallow containers. When the mass had cooled and gelled, it was cut in pieces which were strung up on threads and allowed to dry in the shade. Now, let's turn to the wood on which the glue would be applied. The most common wood used as the base of the bow was maple because of its ability to accept the glue. Horn that is appropriate for the bow must be smooth and free of imperfections and the pieces for the top and bottom limbs of the bow must be identical. The bow is covered on the opposite side by sinew. You think you might just use any maple? You're wrong. If you want a perfect bow, you should get maple from the province of Costamono. Wood and horn would be glued together, but just adding one layer on the other is not enough. Assembling the bow is a rigorous multi-step process in which the bow is repeatedly heated and cooled while the bowyer applies glue in many different layers adding in the horn and sinew at various points in the year-long procedure. The final steps include reflexing the bow to the point that it resembles a pretzel and applying sinew so that the bow will tend to return to that shape and then stringing the bow and going through a final shapening process to increase its efficiency. Now we have wood, horn, glue and sinew. But we are still missing another important part of the bow. Its string. The bowstring was usually made of numerous threads of silk, doubled from end to end, so as to form a loop at each end and tightly bound or lapped at intervals with silk of a different color. To each loop in the silken string were added loops of catgut, joined by a peculiar knot. 
these strings contained as many as 58 threads of silk. At least Globstack claims silk as the main resource for the string, although Goodwin refers to another material. The horsehair bowstring became as refined as silk after saturation in 5 parts beeswax, 5 parts raisin and 20 parts fish glue. All told, making a high quality bow that would be powerful, efficient and durable could take anywhere from 5 to 10 years, including several periods during which the bowyer leaves the bow to dry. After this process, the bow was done and could be used for 200 years. We've heard a lot of descriptions. Now it is time to investigate what we just learned by looking at the basic blueprint for an Ottoman bow. The first part, which was the skeleton for all the rest, was wood. In the best case, it would be maple from the province of Castamonu. The second component is horn, applied through glue on the bow's belly. The belly is the side of the bow facing the string. The other side is the back, facing in shooting direction. This side, again through glue, would be covered with sinew. Finally, the bow would be stringed either with silk or with horsehair. This gives us the full picture of a Turkish bow. It had an average draw of 70 cm. Its underbelly measured 112 cm. The draw weight of the bow would be around 65 pounds, which is approximately 30 kg, all centered on the tip of the arrow. Now, let's look at how to use the bow. We will jump the extraordinarily complex and demanding process of stringing the bow before using it. A composite bow required only the following steps. Retrieve an arrow. Place it against the right side of the bow simultaneously with pushing the knock against the bowstring. Hold the arrow in place with the left hand and the tension of the bowstring. Grip the string, utilizing the thumb grip that requires the thumb ring. Pull and release. There was an essential item which was necessary for the effective use of the bow like Lanan tells us. Unlike in western archery, the arrow was held on the right side of the bow and Turkish bows, though smaller, typically had a longer draw length than western bows. The cyper guided the arrow so that a shorter arrow could be used with a bow of longer draw length, without the bow interfering with the path of the arrow. The cyper allowed the arrow to come up to 3 inches inside of the bow and yet still be guided along the outside of the bow, putting more power into the shot. The critical item here is called cyper. Let us take a look at it. It was a platform which could be attached on the arm of the archer. The arrow was put in a form on the top which resembled a groove. This groove would guide the arrow. Altogether, shooting an arrow would look like this. The arm of the archer would grip the bow. The cyper would be mounted on the arm. In the cyper, the arrow would be placed. Of course, the bow was hardly of any use without this very arrow. So we should take a look at the ammunition. The arrows needed equal care in their making with the flights of swan, eagle, cormorant and other feathers. They usually had 61 cm shafts of pine and gold bone tips. Cases and quivers were elaborately decorated as befitted the most noble possession a man might acquire. I think this is enough of bows for now. We should investigate more modern equipment. Of course the Janissaries had to adapt to the challenges facing them over time and so they had no choice but to exchange their bows for muskets. Early Janissary orders consisted of infantry archers and although most Janissaries were soon armed with guns, the bow remained a prestigious ceremonial weapon through the Ochak's history. Yet it was the Janissaries use of firearms that caught the enemy's attention. At first the soldiers, proud of their neat appearance, disliked dirty guns. But after witnessing the power in Hungary in 1440-43, the Janissaries gradually accepted the matchlock archibus. Goodwin provides more data for this upgrade in weaponry. The first recorded use of guns by the Ottomans was 60 years later at the Siege of Anatolia in 1425, while the Janissaries did not use the archibus until 1465. 
Nevertheless, it took till the mid-16th century until most Janissaries carried firearms. It is worth considering the intentions of this witch to gun powder weapons. In the Ottoman ruler's mind, the use of this new and revolutionary weapon was intended to remain the monopoly of the Janissaries, in connection, one can imagine, with the status as a standing army under the direct supervision of the sovereign, which gave better opportunities for both training and control. Just consider the Sultan's increase in power, when he is the only one with a standing force equipped with modern material. However, this showed to be impractical. An instructor in chief was appointed by the Sultan. In fact, this monopoly quickly became obsolete and firearms circulated among much larger sections of the population, partly because of quarrels between the various members of the Ottoman dynasty. Nicole states their account of a French observer regarding the Ottoman shooting skills. The man shot from a great distance, according to a French observer, and held the guns with one hand. The Janissary's enemies also noted that Ottoman marksmen could shoot accurately by moonlight, while the speed and accuracy of Ottoman musketry still amazed the Austrians in the late 17th century. The early adoption of muskets as well as the high quality of the Janissary's training is a little bit of an enigma when considering that Suleiman the Magnificent had to instruct the commander of the Janissaries to make his men experts in the use of muskets. This occurrence took place a hundred years after firearms became more commonplace. Therefore, Nicole's statement seems a little bit fishy to me. It seems more likely that after some lost battles, the Austrians tried to exaggerate their opponents' abilities in order to make themselves look better. To whichever degree the Janissaries mastered the gunbauer weapons, they were not exactly euphoric in the beginning. At first, the soldiers, proud of their neat appearance, disliked dirty guns. But after witnessing the power in Hungary in 1440-43, the Janissaries gradually accepted the matchlock archibus. To me, this seems a little bit strange. War is a dirty business with or without firearms. Even a trained archer will become untidy when firing a bow all day. Anyway, in the end, the Ottomans turned to muskets. Now, let us look at the guns they used. During these early years, guns were known as Tüfeng, Tüfek or Zabdana, all of which came from medieval Persian words for a blowpipe. Typical Ottoman matchlocks were longer and had a larger bore than those of the West. The flintlock system had probably been invented in Germany early in the 16th century, but it remained unreliable in dusty Near Eastern and Middle Eastern conditions. Consequently, Ottoman infantry clung to the sturdy matchlocks longer than the rest of Europe. Then, during the 17th century, a simple, easy to clean flintlock system known as the miglet or snaplock was introduced from Italy or Spain via North Africa. In the quote before, Nicole had already mentioned that Ottoman guns could be quite sizable. Agostón sheds more light on this situation. Contemporary observers and later historians noted that Janissary muskets were much heavier and thus less practical than European guns. However, we should remember that the Janissaries were using two types of guns, lighter and shorter muskets used for volleys and battles and heavier and longer siege guns. Let's look at the different sizes of those Ottoman blowpipes. We are going to compare the siege gun, the light gun and the modern day AR-15 in regards to length, weight and caliber. The siege muskets were trench guns with a length of 130 to 160 centimeters and had calibers of 20 to 29 millimeters, sometimes even 45 millimeters. Imagine shooting that monster with only one hand like the French observer stated. On the other hand, the light guns had a length of 115 to 140 centimeters, a weight of 3 to 4.5 kg and a caliber between 11 and 16 mm. These weapons were similar to their European counterparts. For a modern comparison, look at the AR-15. This well-known rifle has a length of 98 centimeters and a weight of 3.8 kg. It fires bullets with a radius of 5.56 mm. This Remington cartridge has a length of 45 mm. 
Compare this to the highest radius given before and you will see that the Janissary's bullet could be as broad as a modern cartridge is long. Altogether, you cannot exactly determine which weapons were used because the Ottomans loved to recycle captured weapons and also imported them from all over Europe. Now, let's turn to melee weapons. We have discussed the Janissary's ranged weapons at some extent. While there was a lot to say about the Janissary's guns, we know even more about the bow. Unfortunately, there is relatively little to tell about melee weapons. At first only a minority of Ottoman infantry had swords, most only having bows and short spears. Most swords and daggers were within long established Islamic traditions, so pictorial sources and surviving weapons suggest the Balkan influence on some, tells us Nicole. He goes on. The most common Ottoman saber was the Kilik, broad, non-tapering and less curved than the slender Persian saber. The Kadara was a broad, straight or slightly curved bowie knife of Persian origin, but the origins of the famous reverse or double curved Turkish Yatagan and the associated single-edged straight pala are debated. I'm not going to paint any of these weapons. On the other hand, due to copyright laws, I'm insecure to show any pictures. I suggest you go and google if you want to see some. There were also other weapons in use, although not very commonly. The Janissary's dislike of pikes accounts for the constitution of a separate brigade of halberdiers or axemen. The Janissaries were not good at standing the ground like the Swiss pikemen at Laupen or at any maneuver equivalent to forming a square in the manner of Waterloo. This brings up the question what happened when an attack like a cavalry charge broke through the Janissary's salvos. Swords would not be of very much use under such circumstances. Since the Janissaries disliked halberds, which options were left to them? At this point I should mention another interesting weapon. There is an interesting feature of these Ottoman guns. In the butt of the weapon there was a steel knife, which could be used if the enemy attacked the gunner after he had fired his gun and thus was vulnerable. Although this comes close to the concept of a bayonet, a simple knife seems to be of even lesser use than a sword or sabre, but it seems that was all that was left to a Janissary in case of emergency. But what if an attack went through and a knife or sword was not enough to defend, but a vicious slash or a hard stab hit the Janissary? What would stand between the attacker and the death of the Janissary? Some Janissaries were full armor during early days and siege assault squads continued to do so for some centuries. But by the 15th century, Ottoman cavalry protection was quite distinct from infantry protection. Most armors popularly labeled Janissary are really Sipahi or cavalry armors. And unfortunately, this is everything we can find out about the Janissary's personal protective equipment and therefore already the end of this chapter. And this probably is a good place to take a look at what we learned today. Aside from the big variety of melee weapons, the Janissary's by far most important weapon was the bow. The Turkish bow was a recurve bow. Its production took many years, but the finished bow could be used for up to 200 years. The core of the bow was wood, to be more precise, maple. On the back, which is in the shooting direction, sinew was glued on while on the belly, which is the direction contrary to the shot, horn was added. All of this increased the bow's power. It also tells us how important the glue was. The process of shooting the bow was a little bit different compared to the vest. The arrow never touched the bow itself, but only the string. Therefore, it had to be placed on a cypher, which guided the arrow past the right side of the bow. Of course, even the Janissaries had to give up their beloved bows in favor of muskets. We can see when this happened by having timeline time. The beginnings of the Ottoman Empire lie with Osman I in 1299. The Janissaries were probably founded in 1370 and in 1402 followed the institution of Devshimi by the Janissary law. The first reports of the Ottomans using guns are from 1425, while the Janissaries only started to use muskets in 1465, and it took until the mid-16th century to make them more common.
Concerning Meli, the Janissaries used a variety of weapons, mostly from Islamic tradition, although there was a Balkan influence. The Janissaries did not like long weapons like halberds, they favored swords and even knives. Everyone should use protection and so did the Janissaries. Well, at least when the unit was fresh and new. Later, only assault squads tried to mitigate risk by using armor. And now it is your turn again. Do you have any experience in archery? Would the Turkish way of shooting an arrow confuse you? So long, we'll meet again in two weeks. Stay critical, stay curious, stay free 